Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Biondo, and this is uh, part two of the Excel webinar series on the Atlantis scleral design. Last time we talked about uh, sort of an introductory lecture on the fitting of the Atlantis scleral and some general uh, scleral lens terminology. I'll just recap that really quickly in the first two slides here. So in the Atlantis fit set, which is on your screen right now, you can see we have uh, five different base curves to choose from in the 15-0 diameter. And we have three base curves in the 16.5 diameter. With this set, we always start with lens C, regardless of which patient we're putting the lens on. And then we see if we need more or less vault in order to achieve that 300 microns of vault we're looking for in our central zone. So if we need more vault, if we don't have enough vault to begin with, we can increase our, our steepen our base curve to increase our sag to the D lens, to the E lens, and eventually to F, G, and H, where it'll automatically make the jump to a larger diameter in order to limit the amount of base curve steepening uh, that, that we'll achieve with that lens. If we need less vault, in other words, we have excessive vault in a post-surgical patient, we can move down to lens B and then down to lens A if needed to reduce that vault down to the proper 300 microns uh, that we're shooting for. So there's three zones in the Atlantis scleral lens that we will modify, the central zone being the one that I just talked about where we're looking for that 300 microns of vault, starting with lens C and moving up and down from there. We'll then move out to the limbal zone where we want about 100 microns of clearance, just a, a touch of clearance out at the limbus. Uh, the fit set all come with standard limbal zones. You can manipulate that by going one steep or two steep to increase your clearance, one flat or two flat to lower your clearance down closer to the eye. And then finally, the scleral zone is what actually rests on the eye itself. That's the only part of the lens that's meant to touch the eye. And we just want a nice even alignment fit there. Uh, we have a tangential line uh, that our sclera makes as it comes off the limbus, and so we can land nice and evenly with a flat uh, edge of the, uh, of the scleral lens. And, and that comes in our fit set with a standard, a one flat option, and a one steep option for each base curve. And if it's too tight, we can flatten that edge to a one flat. We can also go further to a two flat or a three flat, and then we can steepen the edge if we have edge lift to a one steep right there in our fit set. So that's kind of a recap of uh, the lecture from six weeks ago, which is available uh, on ExcelSpecialtyContext.com and on Excel's Facebook page if you need a refresher on the general fitting basics of the Atlanta scleral lens. Today, we're going to talk about some more advanced features and some more advanced customization that can be achieved on the Atlantis platform. And that includes a larger diameter lens, the front surface toric, toric haptic or scleral zone, lens notching, uh, the 3D vault zone, which is uh, Excel's new version of reverse geometry, which incorporates reverse geometry, but takes it a step further. And it's very, very cool. And then finally, uh, the multifocal. So we'll start with lens diameter. Uh, contact lens diameters have gotten smaller in the scleral lens realm over time because they're easier to handle. And we're learning more about being able to land a smaller lens just outside of that limbus, which keeps it as a scleral lens. Uh, but sometimes big Bigger diameters are better. And like we kind of talked about for a second earlier, that's the case when we need a lot of sagittal depth in order to get over a very ectatic cornea. So a very steep cornea requires a lot of sag. And we only want to steepen our base curve so much. So when we get to a certain point, like in our fit set, when we get to about a 703 base curve, instead of continuing to steepen the base curve, which is unnatural, induces aberrations, puts minus into the lens, we can simply increase the diameter of our contact. And in the fit set, it jumps itself to a 16.5 diameter. Uh, there's a, another fit set available uh, in the Atlantis platform called the Atlantis Pro Set. And that includes a 17.0 and 17.5 diameter lens. Works just like the standard Atlantis set where you start with one and kind of work up from there uh, in order until you get a proper amount of vault. Uh, but that's going to give you a ton of sag because those little increases in diameter give us really big increases in sag, allowing more normalized base curves, but enough sag to get over a very extreme case of keratoconus or corneal transplant or whatever you might be dealing with in that patient. It's rare that that happens. I would say in my practice, and we fit hundreds of Atlantis lenses, uh, 90 to 95% and closer to 95 probably are, are fit in the 15-0 diameter lens. Rarely do I go to the 16-5, and for reasons of ectasia or sag, I rarely have to go to an Atlantis Pro type lens. An issue we used to have with sclerals that's been mediated or remediated, excuse me, by uh, the, the onset of reverse geometry is the need to get over peripheral opacity. So people with pellucid marginal de degeneration that had a lot of limbal elevation, Salzman's nodules, anything out toward the limbus uh, or, or mid-periphery that was elevated 
would be tough to get over with a smaller lens. Larger diameters used to make that easier. Now we can just use reverse geometry to get over those obstacles. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the 3D vault zone. So that's not really anymore as much of an indication for a large diameter lens. Uh, severe dry eye syndrome, though, still is. Uh, if you're dealing with somebody with graft first host disease or severe Sjogren syndrome, ocular pemphigoid, any of these conditions, uh, limbal stem cell deficiencies that require uh, protection of the ocular surface that we can achieve with a scleral lens, bigger is sometimes better, is often better, assuming that handling is still acceptable. Uh, the reason for that is because it's not just the cornea that's usually uh, diseased or damaged. It, it, it extends that onto the conjunctiva, which you can see with alisamine green or rose bengal stain, where it lights up green or red uh, all the way out uh, through the interpalpebral region. So I like to use the larger diameter Atlantis Pro lenses for those patients to get the maximum amount of coverage and the maximum amount of protection uh, when dealing with those severe dry eye cases. Mild to moderate dry eye that just uh, yields soft contact lens intolerance, I can still go with a 15-0 lens and get a lot of comfort out of it. But the very severe cases where we're actually acting to protect the eye from the environment, larger is typically better. And then finally, probably the biggest reason that I will use to uh, justify an increase in diameter is going to be a big cornea, right? A cornea that just has a large diameter or a large horizontal visible iris diameter. Uh, sometimes a cornea just won't fit underneath the 15 0 lens and it'll actually land on the limbus and we don't want that. These are not uh, corneal, uh, uh, corneal scleral lenses, they're scleral lenses. So we need to be able to get that outside of that limbal region. And they make that very easy for you uh, with the Atlantis lens. I still fit the 15 0 lens uh, whenever I have this issue and I get my 300 microns of vault, I'll check the edge, I'll check the uh, limbal region, uh, and then from there I can convert that to a 16-0 lens. So add a millimeter to it uh, just by using the charts that are included in the fit guide. So if we look at this chart here, we can see toward the bottom, here's our C lens. Uh, the the fit, let, fit set lenses are highlighted in blue. Uh, the bottom one here is our C lens. It's a 767 lens with a 40, or in other words, a 44 diopter base curve. And we can see the sag we get out of that lens is 3.998. All we do to get the same sag in a 16-0 lens is find that same sag value and link it to a new base curve. So if we come over here, 3.993 is very, very close. That's an 849 base curve in our 16-0 lens. So that's the lens we'll order, is 849 base curve in order to get the same amount of sag. But now we have a, a, a larger lens that'll fit over a larger cornea. Doesn't happen very often, but it does happen on occasion. And you can see that lens kind of teeter tottering on that limbus. And that's a good indication. You need to go larger in your diameter. Again, still fit the 15 -0. Just convert this afterwards when you're ordering. One last step to remember is this old SAM FAP. We do have to, since we're changing base curve, adjust the power accordingly. So between these two, we went from a 44 and we flattened it down to a 3975. I mean, we flattened 4.25 diopters. So using our SAMFAP rule, flat, flat add plus, we'd add 4.2 diopters, 4.25 diopters of plus to the final power uh, of our trial lens. Another way to do this that's even easier is you fit your C lens, whatever it might be. You call your consultant at Excel uh, and you tell them, I want this same lens, but in a 16 0 diameter, they'll bust out these charts and do all the math for you. So that'll save you some time and effort if you don't like to do the conversions yourself, which most people don't these days. Front surface torque uh, is indicated anytime we have residual cylinder. Uh, what I found is that in irregular corneas, uh, residual cylinder is actually pretty darn rare. You can have a ton of corneal cell in a keratoconic patient and it gets eaten up very, very well by a scleral lens. And rarely will I even do a spherosil over a fraction in these patients because unless I have to add a front toric, I'm going to leave that lens spherical to give them uh, the freedom from, from having to worry about rotational stability throughout the day. Even if it means they lose a couple letters on the line, I'd still rather have the consistency knowing I don't have to worry about it rotating where the vision could be worse than a couple letter loss throughout the day. That thing can rotate freely without uh, hindering vision at all. So again, in a regular corner is the one time I will always use a front surface torque because of, it's necessary it is the keratoconic patient or the irregular cornea patient who has a toric IOL. Obviously a toric IOL will induce a certain amount of lenticular sill, two and a half, three diopters of lenticular sill that will shine right through the cornea that's been neutralized by the scleral lens. And that's gonna have to be accounted for with a front surface toric design. Regular corneas are a bit different. 
regular corn is just like in a corneal GP. Uh, a spherical scleral lens can eat up somewhere between three and four diopters of regular corneal sill before we start to see it really start to bleed through. In some patients, it can be as low as two and a half. And those patients are going to be very uh, symptomatic to residual sill that comes through that lens, uh, uncorrected sill. So in those patients, if I have a high astigmat who I want to put in a scleral lens for a certain reason, and they have a normal cornea and regular astigmatism, uh, a lot of times I'm going to have to put those in a front surface toric. And they do really work well. And if they need it, they, they do benefit visually significantly. Uh, and you can really get them narrowed down because you can make these down to, uh, you know, the exact uh, de degree of, of corneal access that you need. So you really can get fantastic vision out of this lens uh, with the front surface toric. It comes with uh, three dots at three, six, and nine. It really does help, especially with these lenses. If you have the patient align those dots when they put the lens in to kind of give it a, a chance to get started quicker and hopefully stay stable longer throughout the day. Um, this will also be necessary uh, for less amounts of regular corneal astigmatism if your refractive sill doesn't match your corneal sill. In other words, it's lenticular coming through. That might have to be accounted for even if it's below that like three uh, diopter mark uh, of astigmatism. Lens notching is something that's very, very simple. It's one of the more, I think, intimidating ideas uh, of scleral lens fitting uh, when you're new to the, to, to, the, uh, to the game, but it's something that's very, very simple. Uh, usually we're going to use notching to get around uh, objects like congreculus and filtering blebs. The 15-0 lens, which like I said earlier, we use the vast majority of the time in the Atlantis design will stay inside a lot of those uh, conjunctival and scleral uh, uh, obstacles. But on occasion, you do, need, do you, you do need to notch the lens. If you just ask for a standard notch, which does fit most of the time, most pinguiculas that you come across, uh, they'll notch out about a two, mil two millimeter by two millimeter uh, notch there that'll fit nicely around the obstacle. And then they'll dot the lens at three, six, and nine so the patient knows how to insert it properly. If, it, if you don't think that's gonna work, or you think it's bigger than that two by two, you can mark a lens on your own. You can take an optical pen that you would use to measure seg height on a glasses patient and make three marks on that lens. Uh, two will be the top and bottom border of the pinguecula that you're looking at, and then one will be from the edge of the lens to the inside edge of that pinguecula. And you'll take two measurements. You'll measure the length, and then you'll measure this width here, or this uh, uh, distance from the edge. And you give those to the lab, and they will custom make that notch for you. And always kind of estimate a little bit lower than you probably need. Start small, and you can always send that same lens back, and they will edge it out further or notch it out further if you need to. They're really great about working with you uh, for that. And, and it's very, very inexpensive for the amount of work and customization that has to go into this. This can't be put into a computer. It's actually a, a trained lab tech with a, a Dremel that, that it's notches these out and smooths them over so they're comfortable for the patient. And I think it adds maybe 10 or 12 bucks to the cost of the lens for you. So if it's something you need to do, it's definitely worth uh, doing. And again, with the 15 you can avoid a lot of things. If you do notch around a filtering bleb, obviously, I would never put a scleral lens edge on a filtering bleb that, that will uh, reduce that aqueous outflow and obviously put that patient at high risk of snuffing out the last few axons that they have in their optic nerve. Uh, but even if you do notch around it, still monitor IOP very, very carefully in those patients. And sometimes you'll find they're just not good candidates for sclerosis. That's a rare instance where they might not be just because of the risk of uh, IOP increase with a lens that, that protrudes onto the sclera and near that filtering blood. So toric scleral zones, when we talk about toric scleral zones, we're talking about unevenness in the scleral architecture. And this is something that gets a lot of attention in scleral lenses and much more so now because we're finally able to measure it, you know, with the advent of OCTs and, and laser technology, whereas before we could measure corneal topography with topographers, right? But now we can actually start to understand how that, how that uh, sclera actually bends and moves around the circumference of the eye. And it does change depending on what quadrant you're in based on muscle insertions. Um, as you can see in this photo, though, what you can see here is the, the inside circle here that's outside of the cornea. The cornea is the blue area. The first circle outside that is the 15 millimeter cord length. And at that cord length, you can see we're still pretty darn spherical. The numbers don't vary all that much. When we get out past that 15 millimeter cord length, though, is when we really start to see tericity come into play in that sclera. What that means for us is that if we stick with the 15 0 lens, we really don't have to worry in, in the vast, vast majority of patients about 
toricity in that sclera. If, with the 15 I almost never have an issue where I have to be quadrant specific or change anything as far as uh, the edge profile or haptic design. When we get outside of that into the 16.5, 17.0, 17.5, depending on the patient's, it's going to become more and more of an issue. In fact, the 17.0 and 17.5 Atlantis Pro lenses all come with a toric scleral zone. What we see most often is a steepening of that three to nine zone, side to side, uh, with a flatter area at six and 12. And what that leads to is as the lens settles in throughout the day, you'll actually see blanching or impingement at three and nine and edge lift at six and 12. And again, it isn't always apparent when you first insert the lens, but after a few hours of wear, it becomes more and more apparent. A lot of times those patients will come in and complain about interpalpebral hyperemia and the conjunctiva type because of the impingement. When you actually lift the lid though, you actually see edge lift. And if you see that, you can start with adding toric factor one, which will flatten three and nine and steepen and tuck in that six and 12. You can increase the amount of touristy by going to toric factor two and three if needed, but always start with the least amount possible. Again, the 17.0 and 17.5 will come with touristy already built into them. The, the, the next thing we'll talk about is the new 3D vault zone that Excel uh, introduced in January of this year, 2017. Uh, it's a very, very exciting option to be able to add to scleral lenses. Reverse geometry isn't anything new. It's been done on a number of platforms now. Uh, and reverse geometry is important in scleral lenses because while we can easily fit that central 300 or central uh, vault to, to reach that 300 microns that we're looking for to start with, uh, as we move out toward the periphery, if the cornea uh, steepens instead of flattens, or relatively speaking, um, or shows negative eccentricity, we can have an issue with having enough clearance as we move out toward the limbus. And this is uh, something that's talked a lot about in uh, post-refractive uh, patients. So patients that have an oblate cornea or a plateaued type cornea, we have 300 microns of vault centrally. As we get to the edge of that treatment zone, we can run out of clearance altogether and actually get a seal off at the edge of that treatment zone. And so in the path before reverse geometry, we have to go to excessive vault centrally. That's not good. That limits oxygen to the cornea. So we like to avoid that. One way we do that now is by using reverse geometry to maintain our central vault of 300 microns, but then independently raise up the mid periphery or paralimbal regions in order to get over peripheral opacities that we might see out there, or say the edge of a treatment zone from uh, post corneal transplant, LASIK, PRK, or RK surgery. RK being the worst because they tend to have the most oblate corneas and sometimes even tend to even cave in on themselves a bit. So with the 3D vault zone, you start by being able to vault up that mid periphery in three steps. So you have 3D1, 3D2, and 3D3. 3D1 lifts you 100 microns up, 3D2 150, and 3D3 200 microns up in that mid peripheral region without affecting your central zone and without affecting your edge or your landing. The system takes it a step further though. It allows you to manipulate where uh, you want to place that vault. And so here we have the Atlantis design with our central zone, our limbal zone between these two thin black lines and our scleral zone that we land on. This thick uh, blue line represents our vault in the 3D vault zone. Here in the standard position, it's right in the mid periphery. That's great for our post LASIK, post RK, uh, post PRK patients. It lifts up right around the edge of those treatment zones, just about 10 millimeters out. Some patients though, uh, say PMD patients, have elevations that are much closer to the limbal region. And for those patients, we can go 3D1, 3D2, or 3D3, but then specify it in the out position brings it right up next to the scleral zone here. So again, Pelucin marginal and Salzman's nodules are probably the two uh, biggest beneficiaries of being able to move that, that elevation to the out position. We can also sh shift it to the in position. Uh, this works really well for post-PK patients that have that smaller treatment zone, those corneal transplant patients. Uh, I almost always will move the vault to the in position on those patients. This also works well for patients with very large corneal apexes and keratoconus that spill outside of the central zone and we need a little bit of vault in that paracentral zone, we can get it with the in position on the uh, 3D vault zone, either in 3D1, 3D2, or 3D3. You can do this all kind of based on your regular Atlanta set. You can say, hey, I'm touching my mid periphery and we can vault it up without having to put any sort of additional diagnostic lens on the eye, but they do have an additional 10 lens fit set with two lenses for each of your 15-0 base curves. So we had five base curves in the 15-0 diameter in our standard set. This adds two lenses to 
to those base curves, one with a 3D1 vault and one with a 3D2 vault, so 100 and 150 micron vault in the mid periphery. What the, these lenses also have are these grooves that run through the mid periphery that specify where your vault will be in the in position, the standard position, and the out position. So you can actually place that lens on the eye and decide where is uh, where am I touching and where do I need my vault to to be located, and then adjust up accordingly uh, to the 3D1, 2, or 3. This shows those vaults here in the mid periphery, 3D1, 3D2, and 3D3 getting larger. Ignore the central zone fit here. This lens is sitting right on the cornea, which would not be ideal, but it does demonstrate that lift that we get out of the 3D vault zone. You can see most of the vault is tented up on the back of the lens, leaving the front of the lens prolate, which is more natural uh, and the way we want it. The back of the lens uh, will then uh, eat up most of the, the vault that we've, we've been looking for in that mid periphery. Finally, today we'll talk about the multifocal design. Multifocal is something that can work on some irregular corneas depending on where the apex is centered, but I've really found this to be a go-to lens in my normal cornea marketplace. So it's a lens that solves a lot of issues that we have right now with soft multifocals. One, it corrects cylinder, and it corrects cylinder very, very effectively. And we don't have to worry about rotation with this lens in a, a, a multifocal toric like we, like we would in a soft lens. This one we can just put it on and it corrects cylinder automatically uh, and therefore we just have to worry about the multifocal. GPs have crisper optics, we know that. It's not a mushy optic like a soft lens, it's a hard lens crisp optic that gives better vision and therefore these can give superior vision to any soft lens multifocal with better stability without the need to worry about corneal astigmatism and they're a, a troubleshooting lens for dry eye patients, which a lot of our presbyopic patients are. Uh, borderline dry eye or contact lens related dry eye, this actually treats dry eye therapeutically uh, as opposed to worsening the dry eye like a soft lens can in a lot of cases. So for me now I kind of have three options I give every presbyopic patient who's wanting a soft lens or wanting a contact lens solution to their presbyopia. We have monovision, we have soft multifocals, we have scleral multifocals. And price point now with soft daily disposable multifocals going where they're going in the DT1 multifocal and such, uh, this can be very cost uh, uh, effective for a lot of those patients and very competitive uh, in that marketplace. This does not have any additional fit set, so you'd fit this lens just like you would any other scleral out of your regular fit set, and then you'll add the uh, zone size and the add power to it. It's a center distance design by a spheric multifocal, so the larger zone size will give you more distance, the smaller zone size will give you more near. I always recommend starting in the 4.0 unless they have just grossly observing the patient a very large pupil or a very, very small pupil, then I'll put the 4.4 in the large pupil, 3.6 on the small. But any average pupil, I'll start in a 4.0 and if I need more distance, you can go to a 4.4. I need more near, you can go down to a 3.6 and even do one and one eye, one and the other for just a touch of modified monovision. Ad powers are pretty much spectacle aligned. So whatever their spectacle ad is, that's what I'd start with. It goes from 0.75 to plus four and quarter to after steps. There are 250 ads, start them in the 250. Now you do get the nice free remakes with the Atlantis, so not anything you have to worry about if you have to go up, but I found it to be pretty much on ad as far as the, uh, the spectacle prescription to the multifocal scleral goes. That's pretty much all I have on the additional uh, design characteristics for the Atlantis lens. We'll have another webinar, uh, I believe in about six weeks, uh, where we'll discuss some troubleshooting tips for scleral lenses in general, including fogging and comfort issues, vision issues throughout the day. Uh, so please tune in for that. If you didn't get a chance to see our first webinar, which goes through the basic fitting philosophy of the Atlantis lens, it'd be a really good background for this uh, webinar. Um, that one is available on ExcelSpecialtyContacts.com and uh, on the Excel Facebook page. Uh, something I always mention that Excel will offer if you're new to sclerals and you're not comfortable with them yet and your staff's not comfortable with them yet, uh, Excel will fly a consultant out. If you can line up a minimum of three scleral patients in a day for them, they'll work with you, work with your staff, work with the patient, teach you INR and everything that comes along with that. Uh, if you joined us today, you can use this promo code WebQ3, get $100 off any Atlantis fitting set. And, and I really do recommend if you haven't worked with Excel in the past, it, it's a fantastic lab to work with. Uh, There's a reason I started with them, there's a reason I've stuck with them. It's an employee owned company. You can tell that when you call. Everybody takes uh, 
their job very seriously. All of the consultants who you never have to wait for are all NCLE certified, excuse me, uh, and do a fantastic job. You don't have to, have to listen to a recording. A person picks up the phone every time, and they've got a really a wide array of, of great products for the specialty contact lens practice. So again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, any questions, reach out to Excel, and they can uh, give you my email, and I'll be happy to answer them, and we'll be back on in about six weeks with the troubleshooting lecture.